The Subcommittee on the Interior will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for your patience with our voting schedule today, which always seems to crop up when we have uh, a hearing scheduled. Uh, today we're going to be examining the future of recreation.gov. Now, launched under President George W. Bush, the Recreation Web Portal was created to make it easier for citizens and agencies to access recreational services, whether under the National Park Service, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, or one of nearly a dozen other federal agencies. Today, Recreation.gov serves as the booking portal for reservations at 60,000 facilities and activities on federal lands, including national parks and forests, wildlife refuges, waterways and recreation areas. This portal is a key hub for park visitors and concessionaires. For the past 10 years, recreation.gov has maintained exclusive control over real-time reservation data. Real-time reservation data is the information that a park cabin or tour, for example, has been booked uh, by someone. This information is important when there are multiple booking sites so that no one facility or activity is booked by two different people. Uh, multiple reservation sites need real-time uh, reservation data sharing, but the only place to reserve a facility or activity has been the re recreation.gov website. This exclusive model would appear to be contrary to recent business trends that promote open data sharing and competition. The competition for customers between these sites benefits the consumer. This is the final year of the 10-year website management contract for recreation.gov. In 2014, the Forest Service released the first draft of a request for proposals for the recreation.gov management contract. After numerous comments, congressional letters, and even some media coverage, the government extended the comment period twice and even called for an industry day to bring together stakeholders for a productive discussion. Initial concerns with the requests for proposals revolved around open data requirements and third-party commission language that could eventually make its way into the vendor contract. Though President Obama's administration has placed a priority on open data, some felt the language in the early drafts of the RFP were not strong enough to encourage the open sharing of data that could promote a healthy competition among reservation sites. The government was responsive to these concerns and did make some changes to these areas in successive drafts and the final solicitation, but some ambiguity remained. The government awarded the new Recreation.gov contract on Friday, May 13th to Booz Allen Hamilton. I have some questions, um, and it relates to my time in state government, and I'll tell you my story. Wyoming entered into a contract with a big-name company to create a statewide platform to conduct a wide variety of transactions from government permits to driver's license renewals to event reservations. The state chose a big name company, but they did not have a lot of experience in the field of creating these platforms. And later the contract was canceled, there was a big dispute, we had no platform, it was, it was a mess. And so I hope we're not traveling down this same road here. Uh, today we hope to examine the future of recreation.gov. In the context of the new vendor contract just awarded, we anticipate an open discussion about some of the challenges the website has faced over the past 10 years and how the government plans on addressing these issues moving forward. We also plan to explore some of the ways the Forest Service and Park Service will use this updated site to get more visitors to our federal lands. With that, I would like to thank the witnesses in advance for their testimony. I now recognize Mrs. Lawrence, ranking member of the Subcommittee on the Interior for her opening statement. Madam Chairman, thank you uh, for 
holding this meeting. Today we will discuss the future of recreation.gov, a trip planning reservation and information sharing platform for the nations for the national parks and recreational opportunity. The website is managed by the Department of Agriculture Forest Service on behalf of 12 participating agencies. Today's discussion will not be possible to have without acknowledging the information technology initiatives and goals of the current administration. In 2014, in an effort to develop a customer-focused government through smarter information technology, President Obama created the U.S. Digital Services, which in turn produced what is known as the U.S. Digital Services Playbook. This document, included as an attachment to the newly awarded recreation.gov contract is, compo is comprised of 13 key strategies or plays drawn from successful practices in the public and private sectors that would help government build effective online services. All of the administration plays are part of the new recreation.gov contract and are intended to promote an understanding of what people need using data to drive business decisions and to ensure that the technologies powering the website are using modern secure technologies. Chief among those plays is the concept of making sure recreation.gov sources of data follows the goal of making the data widely available to the public and private industry. Even beyond the digital services playbook, the administration has a guiding principle that government agencies must make more government-generated data open to the public and to private industry. According to the administration, providing easy access to government data delivers more effect, efficient and effective services to the public and contributes to the economic growth by fueling entrepreneurship and innovation. There are numerous examples of private companies that now use open government data in the products and services they provide, including websites like AccuWeather, Foursquare, and Zillow. As the U.S. Forest Services prepare for the future of recreation.gov, it is clear that the agency recognizes the benefits that the administration's digital services playbook and open data policies could bring to the nation's centralized information source for recreational opportunities on federal lands. I remain hopeful, hopeful that the next contractor, will embrace these principles and the future of recreation.gov and will offer opportunities for all stakeholders. I look forward to hearing from my witnesses and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the ranking member. I will hold the record open for five legislative days for any member who would like to submit a written statement. We'll now recognize our panel of witnesses. I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Joe Mead, Director of Recreation, Heritage, and Volunteer Resources of the National Forest System, and Mr. Rick DeLapp, Program Manager of Recreation One Stop at the U.S. Forest Service. We welcome you both. Pursuant to committee rules, witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. Now, I understand, Mr. Mead, that you will be providing testimony, and Mr. DeLapp, responding to questions. Yes. Am I correct? Very good. Um, if you would please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. Please be seated. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Now, in order to allow time for discussion, uh, please limit your oral testimony to five minutes, and your entire statement will be made part of the record. Uh, Mr. Mead, welcome. Uh, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Lemus, uh, Ranking 
uh, Member Lawrence and members of the committee, it truly is an honor to be able to be here today to be able to highlight for you our recreation.gov, recreation one-stop programs. And also, I want to personally thank you for your context that you have self-set uh, in your opening remarks this morning or this afternoon as well. I'm Joe Mead, as you noted, I'm the Director for Recreation, Heritage, and Volunteer Resources with the U.S. Forest Service and help to oversee the contractual process for a number of agencies with our recreation.gov contract that's now underway. As was noted, joining me shortly also will be Rick DeLapp, our Program Manager for Recreation One Stop, uh, you know, as we move into our question and answer dialogue. As you know, our nation federal, uh, nation's federal lands and waters holds a rich legacy for our nation, a rich heritage. From our iconic national parks that enculturate and curate our nation's history, our culture, and our most precious landscapes, to our system of wildlife refuges that ensure that migratory waterfowl have the ability to stretch across the continent and uh, conserve their habitat. To the landscape conservation units of the Bureau of Land Management uh, that help steward these special places. To our nation's waterways under the stewardship of the Army Corps of Engineers, which by the way is our largest provider of outdoor recreation uh, in the nation. And of course, the multiple use and community benefits of our stunning nation's national forests, a rich legacy that we have. And in fact, in 2012, outdoor recreation has paid more than one billion visits to our nation's public lands and waters, a very important statistic, spending more than $51 billion in stimulating local economies and supporting almost 900,000 jobs, a very important contribution to the nation's GDP. Alongside our service providers, uh, our um, partners, and our volunteers, this is an array of outdoor recreation uh, opportunities that's unparalleled across the, the world. It is truly a precious resource, a precious asset that we have here in our nation. Think about downhill skiing or whitewater rafting to lodging uh, or uh, staying in a historic fire lookout. A visit to one of our iconic national parks, one of our unique wildlife refuges. Or maybe it's just a hike on one of our nation's historic or scenic trails or a stroll down the mall. Now, these are all opportunities and benefits that we have afforded to us in this rich legacy. For the Forest Service today, outdoor experiences are the most important contribution we bring to our nation's GDP, generating over $13 billion and generating more than 200,000 jobs. Today, that's actually tripled out of some of our traditional multiple uses as an agency. So we're an agency in transformation as we lean into and value how it is that our citizens connect with us for those outdoor experiences that they look to connect through as they enjoy their nation's national forests. Today, our top leadership is placing a high priority around this connection to our communities. We're modernizing our recreation special uses programs so that rather than regulating use, we're in enhancing and inviting visitor services through our service providers. We're focusing on enhancing our connection with communities through stewardship and volunteers, leveraging individuals' ability to share in that stewardship of their public lands. We're focused on being responsive to the changing demographics in our nation to help be relevant to this next generation. And we're focused on really advancing tech technological uh, co contributions and connections in this digital age that we live. So as I conclude, let me highlight the future in front of us in today's uh, topic for the hearing today, and that's with Recreation One Stop. Imagine with me, if you will, digging your toes in the sand as the sunset is going down from your beach, so say in the Oregon coast. Now imagine while you're enjoying this incredible moment in time, this experience, you're able to pick up your smart device and uh, be able to check on your recreation.gov account, upload your favorite pictures of the day, those fun family shots that you were able to take. Rate your experience at the campground. Was this a good day? Was it a, what was it like? Or maybe even make that reservation for the next uh, recreation event or activity that you want to go do. This is truly a new era for recreation.gov, and that's really where today we're positioning this technology to continue to serve a great asset to the customers and citizens we serve. So continue, a contemporary platform, that, is designed to focus on the user experience first, fostering a delightful and intuitive experience, not a bureaucratic one, designed to be agile, working closely with our developers to be sure that it's designed to be responsive in the moment in time and fostering a dynamic platform that continues to change into the future as we see changes in technology, service, and interest. 
designed as open data, again, taking advantage of modern uh, activity today, such as our uh, application programming interfaces, to ensure that we can connect with third-party interests and really leverage the uh, bout of energy and interest that we have in outdoor activity. Designed with uh, important geospatial features as well, which ones of us would go out without our GPS loaded in our car to be able to have that digital connection in our trip planning. And again, designed with very important, robust uh, security uh, components within it. Over the past decade, we've enjoyed a very secure platform, and we really continue to have that level of security designed into the system into the future. So with that, I'd like to, again, welcome Rick DeLapp, our program manager, to uh, assist me in answering any questions that you may have as it's appropriate. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for his testimony, and uh, uh, we will now begin questions. And uh, Ms. Lawrence, who is the ranking member of this committee, um, has uh, another commitment, and so I am going to recognize her first. Uh, for five minutes, and uh, Ms. Lawrence, please direct your questions to Mr. DeLapp. Mr. DeLapp, do you see outside expert expertise from places like the U.S. Digital Services? Um, we, when we talk about Jumping to play seven, title quote, bring in experienced teams. Do you seek outside expertise? I thank you for the question. Um, absolutely, we do seek outside expertise. We worked with the U.S. Digital Service in uh, crafting language for the RFP mm -hmm. uh, to help us define requirements that would uh, deliver modern technology. Uh, we also, it, it ties in with uh, Play One as well, that we seek, uh, seek out um, end user guidance so that you're, we're building a system that uh, meets n not only our needs, but first and foremost meets the needs of the public and the visitors that are using it. The new recreation.gov contract states, and I quote, whenever applicable, the contractor shall embrace the principles and practices defined in the U.S. Digital Services Playbook. And it continues with all 13 priorities of the U.S. Digital Services Playbooks applied to this program. Several prin principles directly reflect areas of specific emphasis on the R1S support services uh, procurement. So my question to you is play one is titled, quote, understand what people need. So Mr. DeLapp, when the contract was being developed, did you seek public and private industry in input to understand the needs? Yes, absolutely we did. Uh, we, uh, when we began um, thinking about uh, creating an RFP for a follow-on contract. Uh, we started thinking about it back in 2011, um, and we began with uh, 10 different touch points uh, with the public, um, including industry days and uh, private sessions with uh, various vendors, and responding um, to their inquiries. Um, so for three years, we worked with Three. the public to identify what they were looking for mm -hmm. and also work with the vending community to uh, look for new technologies and new approaches uh, to help deliver that new experience. Is this the first Forest Services um, contract to incorporate the principles from the digital service playbook? To the best of my knowledge, yes, it is. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm a... Um, I did imagine myself being in a national park and dipping my toes <laughs> in the water. That was a good place to go today. Um, I just want you to know that the technology piece is, is critical as we want to bring more people into our national parks and to our amazing um, reserves in this country and, and wildlife. And so having um, incorporating this and as we continue to ensure 
all the principles of good procurement and contracting. This is absolutely going in the right direction. I thank you. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. And uh, I yield back. And uh, I, I thank you very much you. for your remarks. Um, I, I now recognize myself for as much time as I wish to consume. How's that? <laughs> um, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening statement, when I was in state government, uh, we had tried to design a, a highly tailored product uh, to provide customer service to uh, all kinds of Wyoming users to save them from standing in lines in public when they, it would be just as easy for them to do things at home uh, at, on their time schedule. And I assume that's true as well with uh, preparing for a trip to our uh, great national treasures uh, for you. Uh, what we did wrong uh, when we did this is uh, we chose not to look at what off-the-shelf products were available. Uh, we went with something that was specifically designed and tailored uh, towards what we wanted. Uh, we uh, through an RFP process, uh, retained a, 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 a very large company uh, with a good reputation, but not necessarily a reputation uh, to build these uh, unique portals. It was a disaster. <laughs> and um, w when I look at all of the travel sites out there that are extremely successful, uh, that are allowing people to do comparison shopping, availability shopping, and uh, have the kind of data available that makes multiple websites uh, even provide alternatives. Gee, if this campsite is booked, um, there's a campsite, you know, just uh, 60 miles away that you could get a reservation at. You know, so you get all this information. They're they're marvelous, and they're they're already made. So my question is, is this product uh, that uh, Booz Hamilton um, has been uh, retained to produce uh, a custom product with custom software, or is it going to borrow from uh, already proven uh, software out there? Would you like yeah. to? Sure. <clears throat> so in our uh, request for proposals, uh, well, let us step back. Um, as we began uh, researching uh, the new technology that we would need to bring recreation.gov into the future, we recognized that there was a lot of new technology and a lot of companies that perhaps did not provide uh, the full-scale service all unto themselves. And we wanted to broaden the competition and um, be exposed to more opportunities to embrace those different types of technology. Um, we encourage teaming between uh, different vendors uh, so they can bring best of breed together um, to provide that service. This uh, solution that we um, have awarded to is uh, very much custom built from Booz Allen Hamilton. Um, it, but it, it's a little bit different than uh, what we've uh, seen in the past. Um, so. What they've proposed is kind of an API, uh, application programming interface centric uh, platform uh, that allows, really allows uh, them and us to add um, and change technology along the way. Because one of the key goals of this um, is to be able to keep up with technology throughout the life of a contract. As we know, technology changes so quickly that the solution of today may not be meet the expectations of people a year or two years from now. So we want to flex them, a very flexible system, and what they have provided us uh, does appear to, to provide that to the government. Is this a 10-year contract? It's, um, it's a five-year base uh, with uh, five one-year award terms that they can earn uh, through uh, you know, quality performance throughout the years. It, Specialized software frequently calls for specialized uh, in-house maintenance uh, and um, augmentation. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be at, at a very high price? Um, is that also part of this? 
if I understand the question correctly, that um, we would anticipate uh, developing the program continuously throughout the life of the contract, including providing maintenance um, and adding uh, new functionality, configuring existing functionality, so that we can provide the broadest range of services to the agencies. What sort of off-the-shelf products or existing technologies uh, were uh, part of the RFP process uh, that you chose didn't, against because they didn't have features that you were looking for? You don't have to name companies yeah. that didn't get the bid, but I'm just curious about were there uh, sort of off-the-shelf products that could be easily adapted, but they didn't have applications that you want? Um, okay, first, I guess I should note that, um, so the award was, uh, we announced the award on May 13th, and we did receive a protest in GAO um, yesterday. Okay. And if I could just uh, refer with my contracting officer's representative to make sure I don't cross that line. Mm -hmm, I understand. I've been in your shoes. Okay. I was state treasurer and uh, bid out all kinds of investment management services, and I had the same thing happen to me. So. I know where you're coming from. Okay, with this one. And if I might, as Rick is concurring, uh, conferring for some insight and advice, I'd like to also kind of offer a frame from uh, our, our program leadership perspective. Uh, as I uh, tried to note in, in some of my opening remarks, and as you'll see in our uh, written testimony, we've been able to very much rely on innovation and uh, insight in, in technology and applications. So a very active expectation of open data so that we're not in a closed environment. This is open data. It's not going to be proprietary. Uh, it's open data that ensures that a variety of third parties can engage uh, with the platform through the application programming interfaces. It'll be an agile development process that's so required of the contractor so that we're ensuring that we're keeping pace with modern technology and changing interest by our recreationists. The bundle of that ensures that we're requiring of the service provider uh, at the price bid to really step up and provide the extensive set of contemporary out, uh, items outlined in the request for proposal that they have submitted their, their uh, proposal towards. Mr. Glapp, further comment? Um, well, yeah, it's, uh, it would be improper for me right now to discuss um, any specific types of software or that were proposed in the proprietary nature in the RFP. Okay. Um, let me then switch gears a little bit. Okay. Uh, will there be any type of gap between when Active Network's contract ends and when the Booz Allen uh, provide, provided con uh, service comes online? Well, uh, you bring up a situation which is uh, admittedly risky in any situation to transition data from one system to another. Um, I will tell you that the bulk of static inf inventory information that is currently available for public sharing, um, as proposed by Booz Allen Hamilton, has already been imported into their system doing testing and uh, they were able to demonstrate uh, how some of that would work in their new system. That's a part of the data. Of course, the riskier part, the more challenging part, is mapping um, data that's more in a dynamic state. Uh, you, perhaps you made a reservation in the old system, but you won't be arriving until the new system is in place. Um, Booz Allen Hamilton has proposed a very comprehensive data mapping uh, plan to move that data. Uh, and to first test that with sample data. Um, so we do anticipate um, some kind of uh, gap um, in the past. It's been as much as a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. We don't anticipate that at this time. But again, it is a, it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's the most important step because we have people's uh, vacations in our hands. And we want to make sure they, that we get it right. And when will that gap, if it occurs, when will it occur? During the height of the summer tourist season, or is it going to occur uh, in a less uh, busy season? So our plan, um, which uh, w because we're in a protest right now, um, and knowing that uh, GAO has until August 31st to adjudicate that, um, that puts our transition plan um, kind of on hold. Mm -hmm. 
in our contract, we have allowed up to 15 months for development, testing, and deployment of a new solution. So originally, um, 15 months from now would be right at the right time for us, the best time. Uh, recognizing you know, that uh, there are some things that we won't have control over, um, we will be evaluating um, the progress of the solution and uh, the testing of it to make sure it's ready to go and the timing. Um, you're right. It's not... It won't be desirable to try to do this during the height of reservation uh, season, but we will evaluate that when we get closer. Okay. Now, switching gears again, what data from the recreation web portal is available to the public? Okay. So currently, um, and this evolved over time, in the late 1990s, the agencies uh, got together to aggregate data into what was then called recreation.gov. Um, it wasn't the reservation service. It was standalone. And it shared data through um, just an XML download, which is basically take everything and parse it out yourself once you get it. And that existed um, on its own until Recreation One Stop program came into um, effect in about 2002. And that's when we pulled the National Park Service Reservation System together with the Army Corps and Forest Service Reservation System and the information that was stored in recreation.gov. And together we called them recreation.gov because the name made the most sense. Um, again, that data uh, remained available for open data sharing through an XML download until 2014 when we launched an API um, on that to provide a, a more modern um, approach to data sharing and uh, different machine readable languages that uh, independent in innovat innovators and developers use nowadays to pull that data and create tools, apps, games, you name it. So right now it's the static data, it's all the information data uh, about a park, about a forest, you know, description, photos, directions, etc. As we move forward, we look to take that to the next step so that we can provide those third parties um, uh, tools that they can help their, their visitors, people who are already on their sites, find that information without having to transfer around. Mm -hmm. So real-time availability is important. If you're looking for a campsite, you want to say, hey, it is open right now. I, I might want to book that. So we, you have information that is tremendously valuable to uh, visitors to our public lands. Uh, it is also valuable to gateway communities mm -hmm. to those public lands. It's also valuable to uh, people who are helping book the remainder of a travel experience to and from uh, the public land experience. And the industry has been trending towards standardization and interoperability. Mm -hmm. So it makes things like kayak and other comparison tools uh, possible. So when someone leaves that campsite, uh, where are they going to stay uh, en route to their next destination off public lands and making them, giving them real-time opportunities to make those kinds of comparisons? Uh, are those going to be possible uh, without a standardized, inoperable product? Or will you have a standardized, interoperable product that can interface with third-party providers? Sure. I think um, the, I, there's a number of kind of tiers of data sharing you can do, I think. Um, the static data is very simple, um, particularly because it doesn't change frequently enough to, to worry about overuse, which might um, you know, be detrimental to performance. So if you have a, a third party that is calling your API frequently, um, you'll either need to increase your server capacity um, at, a, at an additional expense and monitor that and provide additional support. But So tier one I look at as the static data, not usually a problem. Uh, in the middle, you have uh, real-time availability, which we have required access to, um, and that's not a problem. When you get to purchasing or conducting a transaction, say, on Kayak or on a different website, um, it kind of increases the technical requirements of that API to process that. Part of that is because, um, you know, in the federal government, the there are a lot of business rules that apply to staying at a campground. 
It may be, you know, the RV length or the length of stay that you can, can do. And those need to be um, incorporated into the API so that you can enforce those while they're making a reservation there. Furthermore, um, the transaction processing and the financial processing has to uh, be built in a way that the, the revenue or the funds from that recreation fees are deposited not into the account at Orbitz or Kayak, to, but into the U.S. Treasury. That's one of our requirements. Um, if they're due a commission or they earn an affiliate fee, then it would come back um, in the other direction. We, we, never, we, we don't allow third parties to hang on to government money and pay us later. We do it the other way around. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that, that part requires you know, an, an additional level of um, development on the API to provide that. And that, that's very possible, but as we do that, then we look for ways of managing that and setting up agreements with those parties so that uh, everyone is on the same page. Is the decision not to allow uh, third parties to hold that money um, statutory, or is that just a rule, an in-house rule? To the best of my knowledge, it is a treasury requirement. I cannot, I'm not sure if it's statutory or, but we could get back to you with an answer to that. Okay. I, I, I'm curious about that okay. because that, it may be that there are um, impediments to um, easing uh, the access of third parties who have wonderful travel products online uh, by easing up some federal regulations that maybe were created for another purpose that maybe don't fit recreation uh, uh, access uh, very well. And we want as uh, recreation uh, is accessed online um, to make it as easy as possible for people to use public lands. So I'd love to have that information. Okay. Um, the comment period initially, uh, after the initial draft of uh, the RFP was released in October of 2014, the comment period was extended a couple times before the solic solicitation was put out in the summer of 2014. Um, why was the release delayed then? In October 2014, we had released a, a draft final, um, which caught the attention of the folks that I will call the open data community, uh, third party um, entrepreneurs. And they recognized that the language that was in there, well, they recognized two things. The language in there did not su totally support where they thought we should be going. Um, the second thing is, is that we, it's a performance-based contract, and one thing we try to avoid is prescribing specific solutions. We would prefer to have industry uh, give us the approach, we give the outcomes, and they find a way to get there. Um, and, and very specifically, what they wanted us to require was an API. And I, we were in that, I don't know, my contract dilemma there was, do I prescribe this knowing that this is the solution, or do, I, or do we continue with our outcome-based requirements so that if APIs change in the next 10 years to something else, we haven't locked ourselves in? Yeah. So that was the hard part um, to, you know, to, to come up, up with that. And it, it didn't satisfy everybody, but we, you know, basically APIs are the solution, and that is the outcome that we got. Uh, yeah. So... Uh, to continue then, um, so because of that, we, it, we hosted an industry day in Golden, Colorado to hear directly from the third party or the open data community and the vending community and let them discuss amongst themselves in, in a public forum, you know, the pros and cons to this. Um, subsequent to that, we did extend it a, a couple of weeks to allow for more comments to come in and uh, released a final draft uh, late, early the next year. Um, local and state travel and tourism officials tell us they've had difficulty working with recreation.gov. And that's a big part 
of Wyoming's economy. It just became our second largest uh, economic sector, uh, passing agriculture, which is, which is my industry. Outfitters and guides and private businesses also benefit from visitors to our federal lands. Um, what does recreation.gov need to do to improve collaboration with local gateway communities and uh, tourism agencies? And I commend uh, to your attention uh, the, the tourism agency in my state of Wyoming. Um, it's excellent. Uh, and of course, you'll find uh, others that are as well and use uh, public lands, national parks, forests, recreation areas uh, as a draw uh, to their states for also off public land recreational opportunities. So uh, your website and the success of your website and the ability of our states and, and gateway communities to interface with your product is really important to us, hence today's hearing. Uh, so what can I tell my state travel agency? Sure, thank you for that question. Um, I have actually worked with your state agency in the past a few times to uh, share videos. Uh, you, your state tourism office has a wealth of uh, some good videos that I was able to use a few years ago for recreation.gov. I was not aware that they were experiencing a challenge, experiencing a challenge um, coordinating with us. Um, however, uh, what I, I think we're looking for going forward here is how can we ensure that uh, recreation.gov is able to connect with those state tourism agencies and uh, share valuable information to support the recreation economies of the states. Um, the premise of our con one of the premises of our contract is to do just that, is to share data so that um, entities very specifically as a state tourism agency can ingest our information or, or the portions of it that are important to them by filtering out, you know, only the Wyoming information in this case and sharing that on your own website, um, pulling in that real-time availability if, that's the if that is somewhere they would like to go to show that this campground in the Medicine Bow Forest actually is reservable and has sites available, um, to pull that additional information that shows that if this campground is full, uh, there may be another one down the road, uh, and suggest an alternative. So that is exactly where we would like to go, to provide that robust travel planning experience, not just on recreation.gov, but on any site where the people are already visiting and surfing. If, if a state or a local destination has a marketing organization uh, and they're doing a promotional effort uh, for maybe a gateway communities arts festival that is just outside of uh, National Park Service properties, um, how can recreation.gov help leverage that additional visitor activity? that's uh, being promoted locally. Sure, understand. Um, the one challenge I think that we face is when it comes to promoting commercial entities, um, particularly if, they're, if we are in a position to promote one commercial entity over another one. What you're describing does not sound like that. It sounds more like a community or a, lo a municipal event. Um, and really the, the challenge we have is just uh, leveraging resources and making the connections. Uh, to ensure that we are we have the content and it's uh, you know and it works for the local community and f and on recreation.gov. And so, will they be have links or ways to plug in to your product so people can have access to their product? Let's say it's a local arts festival in Jackson, Wyoming. Sure. Uh, so currently, what we um, what we've done, which is somewhat limited, but. Um, if you go on recreation.gov and you're looking up, um, a, a, let's see, a permit for Grand Teton National Park, on that page you should be able to find uh, direct links to the Wyoming State Tourism Office, Wyoming uh, State DOT for uh, road information, and et cetera. And so in a similar fashion, and probably in a much more elegant fashion in the future, we would love to be able to provide that uh, to the, the level that is 
pertinent to that location. And I think what you're suggesting uh, sounds perfectly fine and actually a, a valuable tool to the customer. And, and I don't want to imply that my state is the state that uh, uh, had expressed some uh, concern about interfacing, but uh, apparently um, within the staff here at the committee, there have been some expressions of uh, improvements that could be made. And, and if we might be able to match those people up with you. Sure. Um, I like to give, before I uh, finish a hearing, I like to give our witnesses the opportunity to actually make closing statements, to, uh, to say anything that you wish you would have been asked that you didn't get to uh, tell us, uh, or to offer any closing comments before I close the hearing. Uh, Mr. Mead, uh, you are recognized if you have any uh, closing comments for today. Thank you, uh, Chairman. I very much would like to be able to do that. I'd just like to underscore some of your observations, and that is how important our outdoor experiences are to the fabric of our nation's economy. As you're seeing there in Wyoming, as we see across the, uh, the nation, how and in what way our citizens can engage in healthful outdoor activities and how that can drive economy, uh, satisfaction, and many other values, many other benefits in society. Uh, our goal and interest in a very open data environment is to use the best of modern technology to dig your toes in the sand, to do your trip planning, to be the millennial that can do what you want to do on that smart device in your pocket, uh, or to not if you just want to get on a, a pack trip and enjoy a good old-fashioned, uh, you know, a pack trip up into uh, the, the high mountains of, uh, of the, uh, the back country. So uh, what we're looking for here is a dynamic uh, platform, uh, again, that will be designed in a very agile approach, uh, working back and forth and enhancing it over time. We're looking to engage uh, users so that they actively are shaping what the tool will be like. And part of that user community is the very tourism folks you've highlighted. We want to infuse that energy and find pathways for these tools to be as maximally beneficial to our uh, uh, tourism uh, domestic organizations and interests uh, to a local scale. As Rick noted, we need to be careful that we are ethical about that, uh, and that is a driving motive for us, uh, and, and will not be you know, something that will be put at threat. But we can and do and will do much to help engage uh, that community, state, and uh, tourism kind of values uh, as we move forward in the product. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mead. Uh, Mr. Delap, you are recognized for any closing comments. Th uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, Joe covered much of what I would like to say, so I will leave that at that. I would like to say that, um, uh, you know, recreation.gov is probably one of the best programs in, in the government. We get, to, we get to work with fun, and we love the people that work on our staff, our outdoors folks. Um, are passionate about this job. Uh, we want to make it right. And the way we want to do that is we want to engage with uh, the end users, the states, the local communities, um, to make sure that we're building a product that suits their needs, not ours. Um, and so, and I think we're on the right path to do that. Uh, the requirements in this contract, I think, provide us a lot of latitude and uh, power, really, to harness uh, a lot of energy from technology and from, you know, enthusiastic uh, parties out there that have been following this and really want to build a great product. So, uh, I, again, thank you for your time. Well, I thank you both, gentlemen, for being here today and testifying. As we've heard many times in this committee and others, the decline in visitorship uh, by people under the age of 15 to our uh, public lands uh, gives us all concern. These, this is a population uh, of healthy, energetic people that should be out there enjoying the great outdoors. Um, and we know that culture has changed and that culture in this country uh, revolves a lot around uh, handheld devices mm -hmm. and access to the internet. So our ability uh, to provide uh, a product to them that they can access on 
access on their handheld device uh, gives them the tool and the power uh, to plan their next outdoor recreational opportunity, which will return those young people to our public lands so they can learn, uh, just as their parents and grandparents did, uh, about the great outdoor experiences this wonderful country has to offer. And in doing so, will imbue in them the stewardship uh, that we all hope uh, comes along uh, with feeling that these treasured places uh, are ours uh, to take care of and uh, to hold in high regard. Uh, you're, so the work you're doing is uh, of tremendous consequence uh, and we hope to help you uh, make that product, uh, recreation.gov, uh, the most user-friendly and, and best opportunity uh, that young people and their families, uh, who they coach on how to use those handheld <laughs> devices, uh, have at their disposal uh, to make that possible. Uh, with that, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record testimony that was submitted by the Outdoor Industry Association. Uh, and with uh, my gratitude to you, Mr. DeLapp and Mr. Mead, as well as to Skittles and to our, uh, uh, the others in our audience, um, uh, I, uh, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>